Welcome back, everybody, to Popcorn Diaries. This is going to be episode number two in our ongoing saga of the legacy known as James Bond. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, stop down at Studio 300 and see the wonderful wall of all the great James Bond stuff we have. And we love to talk James Bond, so don't be shy. Stop down and uh, visit us. But today, it's a special episode, as all our episodes are. And we will be talking about Bond himself, the different Bonds through the years, all the way from the beginning to the end. And then we're also going to be talking about the villains. And at the end, we're going to pick our favorite villain and why. Uh, so so let's go ahead and start it off. We're going to start at the top. Uh, Adriana, let's go ahead and start with our first Bond, who was? So we're going to start off with Sean Connery, of course, who started in 1962 with Dr. No. He was the first James Bond. And, of course, if you remember, we had that wonderful beginning moment of this movie. This is what started it all, and you knew right away that this was going to be something special. You didn't see Sean Connery till probably a few minutes into the movie. Someone is at the casino looking for him, and of course he's playing cards. He's got a beautiful woman sitting across the table from him, and we don't really see him. We get all these great over-the-shoulder shots, these great close-up shots, and you don't get to see Bond until someone asks him a question, and then he turns around, and you see him, and he's like, Bond. James yeah, Bond. this yeah, it, it's such a, it's such a great opening, um, and you know he's got his head kind of half cocked. He's got the cigarette going. He's got the greasy hair thing going, and you just know right there this is going to be good. Yeah, it was a cinematic moment that just gave you shivers because you were like, oh, this is the start of something great, and it ha- it was the start of something great, a franchise that has lasted over fifty years, and through the years we've had many different Bonds, but Sean Connery definitely started it off with a bang. He continued on through several different movies so he had Dr. No and then we went on to see him in From Russia with Love which was also a great movie it was the fourth novel that was written by Ian Fleming and a tidbit on that Ian Fleming had actually thought of finishing the James Bond series at this point he actually wanted to stop writing the James Bond's novels but he was convinced to continue on and thankfully he did continue on with quite a few more novels so we got to see Bond on screen so then From Russia with Love we went to one of my personal favorite movies, which was Goldfinger. Yep. I truly, truly love this movie. And I mean, Sean Connery was just consistent throughout his whole performance being Bond. You never saw him really change. He was debonair. He was charismatic. He ha- always had the upper hand. He had this little sarcasm about him when he spoke to the villains. It was just amazing. I loved it. I loved it. Yeah, this this was uh, arguably his best Bond movie. I agree. I agree. This movie was just so well done. I, I think that it has definitely become iconic with Bond. Yeah, yeah definitely. And then he finishes up uh, uh, with uh, Thunderball, of course, another great movie, which you know comes in, in my opinion, a close second to Goldfinger. Uh, and then finally, well, I shouldn't say finally, uh, then uh, he had uh, You Only Live Twice, which... Okay, not too bad, if you will. Uh, and then from there, we changed gears a little bit. We lost uh, Sean Connery. And we did. We slid into Honor Majesty's Secret Service with... George Lazenby. George Lazenby actually did a pretty decent job, in my opinion. Um, I wasn't too put put out by his performance, but he definitely wasn't Sean Connery. No, uh, and a tough act to follow, and I think that's why everyone struggled with it. He did a decent job. But then we had Sean Connery come back for Diamonds Are Forever. Yep. Uh, I understand the story goes on that is they the, the studio said it doesn't matter how much it costs, get Connery back. Yeah, they definitely wanted Connery back. They wanted him to continue with the series. I mean, Connery was very young when he started the series. He was probably one of the younger Bonds that we saw. He was only um, in his early 30s. Yep. So he still had a long length of career to go before him. So they actually wanted him to continue this. So he did come back for Diamonds Are Forever, which was pretty decent. Yeah, unfortunately, that was probably one of his weakest out of, you know, because the other ones were so good. I think that was mainly due to the fact that he knew he wasn't coming back. It could have been a lot of different things. The story wasn't as great, but he still finished off strong, which was great for Connery. And then we moved on. Yep, we moved on to Roger Moore. He started off with uh, Live and Let Die, uh, which 
had the just the great soundtrack. Everybody, you know, with Paul McCartney and that type of thing. I think that's what everybody remembers. Uh, Man with the Golden Gun, Spy Who Loved Me, followed by Moonraker, uh, For Your Eyes Only, and Octopussy, of course. And then his last movie in 1985 was A View to Kill. Yeah, Roger Moore was actually a little bit older. He was, what, in his 40s? Yep. Yeah, he was in his 40s. Probably one of the longest running Bonds with seven movies. Yep, seven movies. I think, unfortunately, um, as most people probably know, Roger Moore is not my favorite Bond. Uh, I, I don't blame Roger Moore because, actually, he did a great job in The Saint earlier on uh, before he uh, joined uh, you know, the James Bond. Unfortunately, he fell victim, in my opinion, to movie-making style of the 70s and into the 80s. True. I got to agree with that. When I first saw Live and Let Die, I was very disappointed where, where Bond was going. It just completely changed. They tried to make Bond completely different because they wanted a completely different style of what Connery had done. So they wanted somebody that was a little bit different. He didn't drink his usual martini. And then he wasn't smoking cigarettes. He had moved on to cigars. We did see a little bit more athleticism with Roger Moore. He started more of the stunts. We yep. had more stunts going on during that era. And it was more gadgeted. It started being more gadgeted in his era as yeah. well. I think one of the main reasons why Roger Moore wasn't as strong as Connery as a Bond is because of his first performance in Live and Let Die. This was not a strong movie at all. We had horrible casting in certain areas, and you know what I mean. Solitaire. Yep. Solitaire was horrible. We had, you know, all these crazy voodoo rituals going on. It just was mayhem. It wasn't a great movie. So I think that's the main reason why his performances afterwards weren't received as well. Yeah, agreed. There was such a big change from 71 to 73 when they uh, came off of Diamonds Forever, uh, Sean Connery's last film, and then right into the Roger Moore Live and Let Die. Uh, you're right. It wasn't a very good movie. That, you know, like I said before, one of the strongest things is probably the soundtrack, unfortunately. And as the movies progressed through the uh, 70s and into the mid 80s until Roger was done, it's gadgeted up. The stories are weak. It's all full of visuals, you know, that did not work. Um, you know, things were fairly outlandish, you know, flying cars and, and uh, you know, so submarine on. Submarine cars. Yeah, submarine cars, um, you know, and, uh, you know, living underwater. And, yeah, so it was it was pretty far out there, unfortunately. But that was movie making back in that day. That's what people wanted, and that's what they tried to give, you know, the uh, viewing public. I got to say, probably one of his strongest films, or my personal favorite from the Roger Moore era, was actually Octopussy. I always love this film. Every time I watch this, it's, it's one of my top three Bond films. So, you know, he didn't have great movies, but he did at least have one that was, in my opinion, a hit. Yeah, that was, uh, I agree. That was his strongest outing, uh, was uh, definitely Octopussy, no doubt about it. That one had a decent story, decent actors. That you know that was that was a pretty good package. It was. So and then we moved on again. We switched we switched gears, and we went on to Timothy Dalton. Yeah, here um, you know Timothy only pulled two movies. So um, you know here in 1987 and 89, uh, The Living Daylights and License to Kill. Yeah, they definitely switched gears here. They went to try to find an edgier, harder Bond. Uh, I'm not sure it worked very well, uh, but I think they were struggling to pull something together. So I think in these two movies, because they were in the rotation now of having a Bond movie every two years. And they had to come out with something. If there would have been a bigger gap, they were afraid the franchise would start to unravel. And that, so they did the best they could. They found Tim, Timothy Dalton. They threw him in there. He did an okay job, but I think the movies, both of them, were fairly weak on their own. Uh, and even a better star would have probably struggled with pulling those movies off. I agree with you. Although I got to say, Timothy Dalton did look more like Bond than Roger Moore. He he definitely was edgier. Their stunts got bigger. Yep. I mean, just from the living daylight, the first moments we see him, he's jumping out of an airplane. Yep. Straight into, you know, this military exercise, into this huge crash where he jumps off a cliff in a moving vehicle and then lands gracefully on a yacht with a beautiful woman. Just from that perspective, we knew that this was going to be a little bit more action-packed than Roger Moore's films. I got to agree, he wasn't the strongest of the Bonds, but I think he did a fairly well job with what he was given, with the stories that he was given. He portrayed Bond as best that he could, and I yep, think agreed. he did a decent job. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, again, I wish he would have been supported by you know, maybe a little better movie making and that type of thing, uh, better script and that. But you're right. When The Living Daylights does open up, you, you know right away things have changed. Uh, the stunts were more realistic. You could buy into them better. And they were more, uh, you know, they were bigger, more, uh, uh, what's the word? I'm giving me a word. Grandiose. They were more grandiose. <laughs> and... I think that set the stage um, with The Living Daylights as now we expect huge openings. And it's pretty much been that way ever since that those first three or four or five minutes in all the Bond films has been just an incredible opening sequence. I do have to agree with you on that. I mean, just the difference from the first movie, Dr. No, to like The Living Daylights is a complete change. I mean, we do still get these moments where, you know, when Bond is first introduced where we don't see him. It's silhouettes, it's close-ups of his hands or him running or things like that. Usually the moment we get to see him is when he's about to say his name. But there's definitely been a change you know, I think some of that had to do with the technology coming out at, during this time, of course. Yep. You know, we had better equipment, yeah. better cameras. Yeah, CGI um, was coming more into it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, you had stunt doubles. You had so much more coming into play during this era that allowed the movie makers to create these huge stunts that actually continued on into the Pierce Brosnan era. Yeah, uh, and, and Pierce, uh, you know, came on in 95. Uh, he did four movies. He did Goldeneye, uh, Tomorrow Never Dies, The World Is Not Enough, and then he ended uh, with Die Another Day in 2002. Uh, so he did four movies. Um, personally, I thought Pierce did a good job. I, I, you know, I, I Definitely a better job than Timothy Dalton. Um, he was edgier when he needed to be. There was maybe a little more humor where he needed to be. You know, the sarcastic bond was a little, uh, a little more there. Uh, and honestly, I thought he had one more in him. I thought they cut him off maybe just a tinge short. I think he was good for one more film. Well, as you know, they had tried to get him prior to um, Timothy Dalton, but it didn't work out because of commitments that, you know, Pierce Brosnan had. When they finally got to him in 1995, he was a little bit older, which I think was good. He had a lot more experience under his belt, and, you know, he got to play along great actors. He had great co-stars. Uh, I, I thought in all four movies, the stories were pretty strong. Uh, of course, there was a lot of great location shooting. And, and all these movies, which, uh, you know, I think really added to it. If I had to pick it out of the four, uh, GoldenEye is probably one of my favorite just because of the overall of the movie. You know, uh, you know of course, Boris being in there and uh, running around in the tank, of course, and so on and so forth. So, you know, that's one of my favorite, although... Um, all four of them, I thought he did a pretty darn good job. Yeah, I think definitely he was one of the better Bonds. He had the support of Hollywood behind him because we had yes, better did. technology. Yep. The stunts got bigger. I mean, some of them, although I, ha I do have to say some of the stunts during Pierce Brosnan era were a little over the top for even my taste. Yeah, yeah. I'm usually the one that's always like, well, it's a movie. It's supposed to be over the top. But there were a couple during this era that I was like, are you kidding me? Really? We're going to go this far. But it was fun. It was action packed. All his movies were action packed. He had great villains, um, great supporting characters. So I think that's what made him ultimately the bond that he was because he had the support behind him. Yeah, and from there, of course, we move into our current bond. Daniel Craig. Of course, he started out with a Casino Royale, which was a remake, uh, the Quantum of uh, Solace, uh, Skyfall, of course. The, the latest outing here just came out last year. And then, of course, there's the next Bond film coming out in 15, which doesn't really have a working title at this point, although there's lots of hints of what it might be. So go on the Internet, check that out. Um, I got to tell you, when I first saw Casino Royale, and I did see it in the theater, and I did see it in IMAX, I right there I said, oh, my God, we are in for a ride. Uh, if you remember in Casino Royale, it's that black and white opening of where he's fighting that guy in the restroom, and it's grainy, it's gritty, it's dirty, and it's just – it's uh, – yeah, this was definitely one of the better openings for Bond because you had him in this gritty all-out fight. You know, this is like his starting, the starting of his career uh, when he gets his double O status. When I first saw this as well, I was taken aback. I was like, here we go again. This is what I was waiting for. This is, I think that this beginning of Quant a Casino Royale brought us back to a good marriage between the action-packed and the 
debonair, charismatic bond that we had in the beginning. Yep. Daniel Craig is definitely one of the strongest bonds. In my opinion, he is the best. <laughs> I He's definitely brought me back into loving the series and wanting to see more of it. So Casino Royale was action-packed. It had drama. It had romance. It had the locations. It had everything that we expected from a Bond, the villain. You know, everything was great. All the characters in this movie did a wonderful job. The acting was phenomenal. The story was not weak. Um, nope, it was and a great and story. they definitely followed it up well with Quantum of Solace. A lot of people say Quantum of Solace was probably the weakest of these yeah. three. Yeah, I've heard that too. You know what I say, folks? Get over it. You know, I actually really appreciated this movie. I thought it was great that they had this little bit of continuity going forward with him still struggling to get over Vesper's death. Yeah. So seeing what he did to get revenge for her death was being able to see behind the spy to the, to the man. Right. And, and there was some closure, too. There was. So then at the end of this movie, we see that he's just like, I'm back. Yeah. You know, he got over it. He's like, that's it. I'm moving forward. And we move into Skyfall, which was definitely one of my favorite films. Yeah, this film is just amazing. And I think it has a lot to do with the villain. Yeah. I really do. <laughs> the villain in this story is just. Oh, my God. So creepy. Creep, creepy is, is a great word, and I do agree with you with Skyfall out of the three. And, and it is tough because I think all three movies are exceptional. Uh, but Skyfall, I think, is going to nudge out to be my favorite out of the pack so far. The thing about Daniel Craig is he's a no-nonsense Bond, and that's what Sean Connery was all about in the early movies. Come in, do your job. Yeah, get the girl and all that kind of stuff. But, I mean, he was there to do a job, and he was going to get it done. Yeah, and I think that we've seen a little bit more of Bond's character development in the last few films. We've gotten to see a little bit behind what makes the spy. So we get to see how he started, what got him to the point where he became 007. Yeah. And we had definitely one of my favorite M's, which is Judy Dunch. I think she's done a phenomenal job all throughout her time. Unfortunately, of course, we lost her in Skyfall. I was so devastated by that. Judy Dunch just has done such a great job portraying M. And in these last few films, you get to see this almost attachment between her and Bond. Yeah, there, there's, there's definitely a strong bond uh, no pun intended, folks, between the two of them. There's a relationship there uh, that gets tested off and on through the movies. Uh, and yeah, it was tough to see her go at the end of Skyfall. I, I can't imagine a better M. No, I can't. At this point, they've they've kind of considered Ralph Fiennes. We'll see if he does return in the yeah. next movie. Um, at the end of Skyfall, we did see that he was considered the new M. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that he's going to be playing them. Right. And and they did a great job in Skyfall of introducing him and as the new M, you know, because you pictured him as basically just a, you know, a, a, a you know, paper pusher, mm -hmm. bureaucrat. You see in the, in the courthouse when the whole scene goes wrong and everything starts getting blown up, uh, that he turns in, into a fighter. And, you know... All of a sudden, it's like, well, wait a second, this guy just isn't an administrator. You know, this guy really does have what it takes to take control. Uh, and then, of course, we see at the end of Skyfall, uh, of course, you know, Daniel Craig stands there and openly recognizes him as, you know, you are the boss and I'm, I'm ready to go to work. One rumor that I had heard, which I don't know if it's true. Yeah, we love rumors. <laughs> I love rumors. Silva, which was played by, by Javier Bardem. Yeah. Um, I heard a rumor that he would be coming back. Really? I did. I, have I not heard, heard a that rumor. Bond, I, I don't cause... know how they plan to pull this off. We did see him die at the end of Skyfall. But he, this might be another Blofeld instance where we see a character that we thought was dead come back. Not sure how this is going to play out. I'm not sure if this is accurate, but this is a rumor that I've heard quite a few times over the last couple of months. So we'll see how that is. Uh, so I've got to ask you. And I think I know the answer. Your favorite Bond? You know my favorite Bond is Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig. There's just so much that I've seen come out of Bond's character, and Daniel Craig has just brought it to life for me. I think a lot of one of the points that I do have to make is that the reason we saw such a change where we got away from the gadget, we got away from these stunts that were just so over the top, had to do with the born identity. 
The Born Identity did so well, and it was a different type of action character. This character that was into close quarters fighting, it was more military tactics. Yeah, gritty. Um, gritty just, yeah. just these fights that were you were just you just heard those slaps and those hits and you rooted for this character and i think the that we saw a definite change once the born identity came out in a lot of action films we saw then um also liam neeson and taken he was the same type of character yep. gritty just all out come to get you hunt you down and that has become more of a standard in Hollywood. And it, and it's what we see day to day more, a grittier character, less over the top action right. and something that's more believable, which is why I really like the direction that the Bond series has been going. And another reason why I really like Daniel Craig playing it. <laughs> yeah, uh, agreed. Uh Picking my favorite, of course, uh, uh, you know, Daniel Craig is my number two by, uh, you know, by far. Uh, but I have to go back to Sean Connery. And that's pretty much because of what he started, what he represented in the early movies. You know, it's just it's just hard to beat what he brought, you know, to the table to start this entire franchise. I often think if Sean Connery was not cast and somebody else was and that list is long, would there be a 24th Bond movie? So let's move on to... The bad guys. Okay, so we're each going to pick a bad guy and maybe highlight just a couple of others because there's so many good ones. Uh, one of the strongest things about the Bond films, uh, and I'm going to say this for all the Bond films, the they have the greatest bad guys. Some are a little more outlandish than the others, over the top, if you will, but they're all really unique characters. Uh, we already mentioned a couple, you know, Raul just being plain creepy. Okay, and just and just cold. Elliot Carver, of course, uh, just being just cold, cold. Didn't matter. Kill him. It doesn't matter. That type of thing. And, and then you know people like Jaws, which you know, come on, really, guy with the big giant teeth biting through cables and stuff like that. Just you know, almost cartoon characterish, yeah. if if you will. But somehow they got away with it. Uh, so Adriana. Give me, give me, give me your take on some of the. Uh... So I was definitely creeped out by Javier Bardem's villain portrayal. He was definitely this very creepy character bent on getting revenge, and I think that he made it very personal. So that's why he was even more creepy. We got a, We had a lot of villains throughout this whole series. Some of them wanted to take over the world. Some of them were just egotistical. Some of them just really hated Bond. Some of the top ones that I always remember is Goldfinger. He was just so good as a villain. And one of yeah, your favorite lines is from that movie. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I agree with you here. Goldfinger, if I had to go through the entire list of bad guys, um, no doubt he is my number one bad guy because he he was he was cold all he cared about was gold didn't care who got in his way um he was a gentleman yes he was yeah he was a gentleman he acted like a gentleman you know he drove a, a great car uh but he had this whole support staff if you will of killers like odd job and uh he'd, he'd take you out in a heartbeat wouldn't even think about it and of course when bonds on the table get uh, getting ready to get cut by the laser you know, that, that's where that famous line that has been quoted so many times where Bond says, you know, do you expect me to talk? And, and of course, Goldfinger says, no, I expect you to die. You know, and it's yeah, just like. Yeah, this is definitely ah. one of the best lines ever said by any villain in a Bond film. And then another one that I'd like to touch upon was Elliot Carver, yep. which was portrayed by Jonathan Price. He was a cold, mean person who wanted to just kind of ruthlessly control an empire and he didn't care how he did it he was definitely very cold and unappealing and i really didn't like him but that's that's the signature of a good villain but my favorite of the bunch my favorite villain of all time was actually blofeld blofeld well yeah because he, he makes several appearances by several different actors he just would not die <laughs> yeah the man would just not go away i mean <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly why I really like this villain character. I mean, he was actually even portrayed. Mike Myers' interpretation yeah. of Dr. Evil mm -hmm. um, is based off of Blofeld. Blofeld appears in six different James Bond films. So from Russia with Love, Thunderball, 
You Only Live Twice, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, Diamonds Are Forever, and For Your Eyes Only. As you know, Blofeld had some cosmetic surgery and (laughs) suddenly he was completely a different person. You know, many of his characteristics have become cliches of supervillains in popular fiction. Um, He's the evil genius. You know, he's got that white cat that he's always petting. Sitting there where you really don't see his face. All you see is the body shot of him sitting there with the cat on his lap and he's just barking out orders like, you know, okay, number two, kill him. So what was your favorite villain? I had to go with Goldfinger. Hard, it, it, you know, it's, uh, even though uh, you mentioned uh, Elliot Carver, uh, you know, I, I thought La Chief was also pretty cold uh, and some other ones in there. Uh, but Goldfinger, just again, because what he represents, uh, he was a gentleman, he was a killer. Anybody who stood in his way got eliminated and he didn't even think twice about it, you know, uh, basically, you know, crush them, throw them in the car, you know, that type of thing. And, and it just, you know, it's like, okay, you know, business as usual. Uh, so, yeah, how do, you, how do you deal with somebody like Goldfinger? Um, but, you know, he gets it in the end. He does. <laughs> yeah, so we've had some great villains, some, some great bonds, no doubt about it. But, Adriana, what's next? Next time on In Popcorn Diaries, we're going to be talking about behind the scenes of Bond, the technology, the writers, the direct. We're definitely going to touch upon the title sequences. So we're going to get to talk about all the behind the scenes of Bond. Yeah, and we're going to have lots of little tidbits of things you may or may not know uh, that took place uh, behind the scenes. Thank you for joining us today, and we will see you next time. I'm Adriana. And I'm Joe. And this was Popcorn Diaries. Popcorn Diaries.